brief and that will take a, a few seconds to kick in. Okay, let me check. I believe we might be live at the moment. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Low Physics webinar. My name is Alejandro, and I'm going to be your host. Today, we're presenting Gravitomagnetic Tidal Driving of Rotating Neutron Stars by Eric Poisson. Eric obtained a Bachelor in Physics from Laval University and a PhD in Theoretical Physics from the University of Alberta, where he worked under the supervision of the great Werner Israel. Before joining the Department of Physics at the University of Gulf, he spent three years in Keith Thorne's group at, the, at Caltech and a year with Clifford Will at Washington State in St. Louis. Professor Poisson works in many areas of general relativity, including black holes, neutron stars, and gravitational waves. He's also a fellow of the American Physical Society, an affiliate member of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, also in Canada, a member of the Editorial Board of Physical Review D, and he served as the president of the International Society of General Relativity and Gravitation. He has published two ex extremely beautiful textbooks, uh, Relativistic Toolkit and Gravity, Newtonian, Post-Newtonian, Relativistic, and that one was co-authored by Cliff, Cliff Wheel, with Cliff Wheel. So remember, you can ask questions over email through our YouTube channel or Twitter, and then the questions will be read at the end of the talk. We are very happy to have you, uh, Eric. So please take it away. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. Thank you very much uh, to all the organizers for the very nice invitation. I'm very honored to be speaking in this uh, speaker series. So let me share my screen and hope that everything goes well. So do Perfect. we see, do we see that? Yeah, very yes. good. Okay, so, um, me, okay, very good. All right, so lots of very strange words in this title. So I will try to explain all of this. So my intention here is to have, you know, a fairly short talk, introduce all the stuff with a minimum of technical details and hopefully, uh, you know, convince you that there's some very interesting physics going on here and physics that can uh, soon be revealed through the measurement of gravitational waves. Uh, in case you're interested in the details, uh, I have two papers here that details everything that, I've, that, uh, you know, that I'm talking about today. So, all right. So the context for uh, this work is uh, gravitational waves. So we've, you know, about five years ago, we've entered this very exciting era of gravitational wave astronomy. So we're all very excited about this and the results have been coming. So it's already been a very exciting, uh, you know, discovery path. And we uncovered, you know, a class of black holes we didn't know about. But my focus here will be on gravitational waves that might be coming from a binary system involving at least one neutron star. So we could have two neutron stars, we could have one neutron star in a black hole, but one of the objects has to be a neutron star. And I'm interested in the late stages of the inspiraling motion of that binary system just before the system is about to merge. So uh, as all of this is ongoing, the system emits gravitational waves and those waves are now being you know, measured by a network of gravitational wave detectors. We have the two LIGO detectors in the US. We have the Virgo detector in Europe and uh, I think the CAGRA detector is just about to go online. And so far there's been a few detections of gravitational wave events that uh, you know, probably contain two neutron stars. This one over here, that one is for sure a neutron star event that was observed not just in gravitational waves, but also in uh, gamma rays and, you know, the whole band of electromagnetic radiation, a very spectacular event that we've, you know, been very excited about. This one here is likely to involve at least one neutron star, but there's been no electromagnetic counterpart to this, so we cannot say for sure. And this one may contain a neutron star, but it would be a very large neutron star, larger than anything that we've seen so far. So that one is a bit uncertain, but in any case, we already have had uh, measurements of gravitational waves coming from neutron star systems. And as things keep going, uh, when LIGO goes back to uh, you know, observations, uh, there'll be more of them 
as the detectors go more and more sensitive. This is a picture of the Virgo facility uh, in Italy. So you have the, uh, the two uh, vacuum tubes. And as you know, LIGO works with laser interferometry. Gravitational wave detections work with laser interferometry, where you have laser beams bouncing back and forth and being recombined here. And you hope to reveal the very tiny motion of the end masses at the end of the vacuum tubes here as the, uh, as the laser beams recombine over here. All right, so why neutron stars? I mean, black holes are pretty exciting objects. They're very fascinating, but neutron stars are, well, you know, sometimes in my mind, even more interesting because black holes have nothing, right? Black holes are just boundaries in space time. Whereas neutron stars have all of this very complicated, very poorly understood nuclear physics that goes on deep uh, inside uh, these bodies. And what uh, really excites me and excites a whole bunch of people is the perhaps ability to use gravitational wave observations to learn something about the poorly understood nuclear physics that takes place inside neutron stars. And the way that this is gonna be done, at least in what I'm gonna be talking about here is through the tidal interaction between the one neutron star and whatever the companion is. So I'll focus on the neutron star and will you know, think of the companion going around it. That companion could be another neutron star or it could be a black hole. It doesn't really matter for what I'll talk about here. So the idea is that the neutron star will experience the tidal field exerted by the other one. So the tidal field is the homogeneous gravitational field exerted by the other one. It's the fact that you know, the field uh, on one phase of the neutron star is gonna be stronger than on the opposite phase. So that creates a differential gravitational field across the volume occupied by the neutron star. And that homogeneous gravitational field will tend to produce a tidal deformation. And because the object, the neutron star deforms, well, that changes everything because the tidal deformation means that what you have is no longer a point mass orbiting another point mass. Now you have deformed objects. And that means that the orbital motion is gonna be slightly affected. And because the orbital motion is slightly affected, that will be manifested in the gravitational waves. So there's you know, a subtle effect in the gravitational wave form that reveals this tidal interaction. And the reason why this is uh, interesting and important is because, well, objects of different internal structure will deform differently. So the amount of deformation that can be revealed in gravitational waves will depend in a very sensitive way on the internal structure of the body. And it's that internal structure that is governed by poorly understood, poorly known uh, properties of nuclear matter at those huge densities that we find inside neutron stars. So what I'm talking about here is the prospect that a measurement of you know, tidal deformation in gravitational waves can tell us something about nuclear physics. So just to give you an idea of how poorly understood the nuclear physics of neutron stars is, I mean, we have some ideas. I mean, we know that we're dealing with neutron rich matter. We know that, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, at, you know, at fairly low densities near the surface of the neutron star, we have some pretty good understanding. But as we go deeper into the star, as we increase the density, well, the properties of nuclear matter are poorly known because those densities far exceed what we can produce in the lab. So the nuclear matter at those densities can be very different from what we can measure here in the lab. And people have formulated all sorts of, you know, tentative, you know, candidate equations of state to describe this. And what I'm plotting here is as a function of those equations of state that have been compiled by various groups doing nuclear physics, what I'm plotting here for each one of those model equations of state is the mass of the neutron star in solar masses. Hopefully you can read the numbers here. Uh, and radius of the neutron star in kilometers. And what you should see here is the fact that, well, if you pick one equation of state, you have one relationship between the mass and the radius that might look like this. But if you pick another equation of state based on different assumed physics for the nuclear matter, well, you might trace this curve or you might trace this curve 
And the point is that, you know, these all being plausible models of equations of state, those curves are all over the place. So uh, for a two solar mass neutron star, for example, you might have a radius that ranges from 10 kilometers, more or less, to 16 kilometers. And that really means that uh, there's a ton of uncertainty about the you know, the, the, uh, the details of internal structure for, for a neutron star. And what we're hoping to achieve with gravitational waves is constraints. We want to constrain this range of possibilities. That's one way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it. There are currently a very nice uh, apparatus going uh, on board of the International Space Station that's called NICER that measures X-ray emissions from neutron stars. And that uh, gives you a handle on the radius of the neutron star. So that's a different way of putting constraints on the equation of the state. Uh, here I'm talking about something slightly different using gravitational waves. So that's the context of the work. What I want to do next is to mix in uh, two ingredients that are gonna be the essential things that will give us all the physics that I want to describe in this talk. And those two ingredients are uh, what I call gravitomagnetism, I'll describe what this is, and stellar rotation. So stellar rotation is just the property that the neutron star might be spinning on its axis. And if it does that, uh, it basically opens up uh, some new physics that you wouldn't get if you didn't have stellar rotation. And if you mix in stellar rotation with gravitomagnetism, then you have something that's really fabulous. And that's what I'll be describing in uh, the rest of the talk. So in principle, I'm working in full general relativity because if I want to do justice to gravitational waves, I want, if I want to do justice to neutron stars, I have to work in the full framework of general relativity. But here I'll allow myself some leeway and I'll say, let's work in an approximation to that. Let's assume, even though it's not a very good approximation, but let's assume that velocities are small compared to the speed of light. And let's assume that the gravitational field is not that strong. So that this combination of mass and distance is small compared with one. So not a very good approximation for neutron stars, but it allows me to do something that otherwise would be too complicated to do in, uh, in full general relativity. If I adopt this approximation to general relativity, then I find that gravity is described in terms of two ingredients that are gonna be familiar if you're, you know, if you remember your graduate work in electromagnetism. In this approximation, we have that gravity is described in terms of a scalar potential that I would call gravitoelectric. That's basically the Newtonian potential that's familiar from Newtonian gravity. But on top of that, we have a vector potential that's very analogous to the vector potential in electromagnetism. And that I call gravitomagnetic. So we're talking about gravity, but we have a scalar part that is analogous to electricity in Maxwell's theory. And we have a vector part that's analogous to magnetism in Maxwell's theory. So basically we have a theory of gravity in this approximation that really resembles electro, you know, Maxwell's electrodynamics very closely. For example, the scalar potential here that is familiar from Newtonian physics is produced by mass. So rho is the mass density, and we have this familiar looking Poisson equation relating the mass density to the scalar potential. That's familiar Newtonian gravity. But in addition to that, we also have this vector potential that is now produced by mass currents. So if I take the mass density rho and multiply by the velocity of whatever is moving in my system, then I have a mass current that's analogous to a charge current. And that is producing a vector potential in the same way that charge currents uh, produce a vector potential in ENM. So we have this close analogy at the level of the field equations, but in, you know, in, in addition to that, we have a close analogy in, uh, in the force that fluid elements, for example, if I'm looking at the fluid body uh, in my neutron star, if I'm looking at the fluid inside the neutron star, each fluid, uh, fluid element will undergo a force that's gravitational in origin. And that force will have, well, a Newtonian component, that's the gradient of the scalar potential that's analogous to an electric field. 
but it will also have this force, you know, V cross B type force, where my B field here is not a magnetic field, but it's produced, you know, it's, you know, the gravitational analog of this associated with that uh, vector potential. So the, the curl of the vector potential produces a gravitational field that's very analogous to a magnetic field in gravity. And that B field in gravity couples to the velocity in the same way as in the Lorentz force. So we have a V cross B term in the force that is given to us in this approximation to general relativity. So what I want to uh, do here is to take those two ingredients, gravitomagnetism that produces this vector potential in this B field and velocity. And I want to actually, you know, really focus on this Lorentz force acting on the fluid inside a neutron star. That's going to be the force that governs the physics that I want to describe next. So there are two Vs in, in, in this slide. V here, uh, you should think as the orbital velocity of the companion, of the companion. So I'm focusing on my neutron star here, the fluid inside of it but I have this companion in orbit around it. And that V here is the orbital velocity of that companion. That's the origin of the mass currents that gives me the origin, you know, that gives me this uh, gravitomagnetic uh, field. That gravitomagnetic field is gonna be stronger here and weaker here. So it's not gonna be homogeneous. And the homogeneity in that gravitomagnetic field is gonna produce a tidal force inside my neutron star, that tidal force is gonna be created by the orbital velocity of the companion. That's the first V. The second V is in this equation over here. And that V is gonna be the velocity of the fluid elements inside my neutron star. And that is given to us by the stellar rotation. That's why I need both. I need the B field coming from the orbital motion of the companion and I need stellar rotation to produce that V over here and combining the two, that means that I have this magnetic type force acting on the fluid element. That's the two ingredients that are coming together to produce that force. And what we have here therefore is a new type of tidal force that is not this one, that's the familiar you know, Newtonian tidal force. That's something extra that comes from general relativity and described in that approximation. So stellar rotation, gravitomagnetism, and this extra term in, uh, in um, the equations governing, governing the, fl the, the fluid mechanics inside my neutron star. All right, so those are the two main ingredients and that's where all the physics is gonna be coming from. And what I want to do ne next for the next few minutes is just to go a little bit you know, deeper into the fluid mechanics inside a rotating neutron star. And I'll do this with you know, as little uh, technical details as I can manage, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what people do when they do fluid mechanics, especially when you want to perturb a fluid configuration from equilibrium because you have this tidal force acting on it. So the idea is that the tidal force that we've talked about uh, just before, well, that's gonna create a deformation of the fluid distribution. So the tidal force will change in direction. It will change in intensity as the companion uh, orbit around the neutron star. And that's the thing that's gonna describe, you know, the, the form the fluid. And that's the thing that I want to then eventually incorporate in a model of emission of gravitational waves and all of that. So we'll come back to that, those aspects later. But now, excuse me, I want to focus on the physics of the fluid mechanics uh, inside the neutron star. And what people always do in physics, and that's true also in fluid mechanics, is to try to decompose everything in terms of normal modes of you know, vibration. In this case, you want to form a basis of basic deformations and you want to analyze whatever is produced by the tidal forces in terms of this basis of basic vibrations. So, I'm going to decompose everything in terms of normal modes. And the idea is that, you know, the fluid variables collect together, they form collective variables that can be grouped into uh, collective behaviors. And that's the sort of uh, thing that we call normal modes. 
So uh, what do you do? Well, you say, well, let's consider the perturbation in density. Let's consider the perturbation in pressure and let's consider all the relevant perturbation variables. And we're gonna assume that they vary in time as you know, e to the minus i omega t. So there's gonna be some frequency associated with those modes. And there's gonna be some you know, profiles associated with each mode uh, how it produces a, a deformation in density, a deformation in pressure, and all of that. And when you work out the fluid equations, you know, Euler's equation, continuity equation, all of those equations from the fluid mechanics, and you make this assumption that the, you know, that the deformation you want to describe is of that form, what you end up with here is an eigenvalue problem for all of those modes. So the collective behavior is gonna be captured in terms of eigenvalues for the frequencies and eigenfunctions for the collection of fluid variables. So what's gonna be important for us here is the fact that as you solve this eigenvalue problem, you get basically a whole set of uh, eigenvalues, eigenfrequencies for the modes. I'm gonna label them with a K here. And corresponding eigenfunctions, we won't focus on the eigenfunctions. Uh, but the eigenvalues here, the eigenfrequencies will be important. And then what's even more important is the fact that conceptually this collective behavior uh, boils down to each mode behaving as a driven harmonic oscillator. So what you can imagine here is that instead of a star jiggling about because of fluid deformations, you can replace all of this by a whole set of harmonic oscillators that are gonna be driven by that tidal force created by the orbiting companion. So conceptually at this level, what you have is a whole bunch of harmonic oscillators driven by an external tidal force. So it's a very convenient way of thinking about the problem. And you know, in fact, it corresponds to all the mathematical stuff that has to go behind the scene here. All right, so uh, what are those modes? So what do they describe? So let me focus for the time being on a non-rotating star and then I'll switch on rotation uh, in the next slide. So with, if you do this fluid dynamics for a non-rotating star, what you find is when you do this eigenvalue problem uh, business, what you find is that there are two classes of modes that emerge and they have slightly different physical properties. And people call them P modes and G modes. And the P and the G have to do with what is restoring uh, the mode to equilibrium, uh, you know, in the fluid mechanics. So the analogy here is a little pendulum. So if you push a pendulum, there's going to be a restoring force that, <coughs> excuse me, that's going to take it back to toward equilibrium if you push it. I'm sorry, my voice is <clears throat> losing my voice. Sorry about that. So if you have any, uh, if you have a pendulum like this and you push it forward, there's going to be a gravitational force that's going to restore it back to equilibrium. And then, you know, the balance between the motion, the inertia and the restoring force will produce this, you know, oscillating motion. Well, the same is pretty much true for the fluid motion. And you have different types of restoring forces that give, that give different properties to the modes. And P modes are, are, are modes that are primarily restored by pressure uh, so the pressure is acting back to restore the equilibrium of the mode. And that's very much like the physics of sound waves. So P modes are like, are like sound waves, but there are you know, modes inside a spherical star instead of being you know, modes in a three-dimensional you know, homogeneous uh, fluid. G modes are primarily restored by gravity and those are like gravity waves uh, that are familiar if you're you know, studying the ocean or something like that. So two broad classes of modes. And when you work out the eigenfrequencies for those modes, well, typically you find a mode frequency that will have an order of magnitude that's gonna be governed by the mass of the neutron star and its radius. And if you put in the appropriate scaling here, a 1.4 uh, solar mass for the neutron star and a 10 kilometer radius for the neutron star, what you find is that typically the mode frequency will be in the kilohertz. And uh, the kilohertz, you know, two kilohertz or so happens to be quite a bit larger 
than the gravitational wave frequency that you get during the in spiral of a binary system of neutron stars. And that fact will become important when I talk about resonances a little bit later. So typically the mode frequency that you get is in the kilohertz range, and that is larger than, than the typical gravitational wave frequency that you get uh, during an in spiral through the LIGO uh, Virgo band. Because of that, uh, because of that mismatch in frequency, what we find is that P modes are relevant, but not that relevant because they never have a chance to come to resonance during, uh, during an end spiral. G modes tend to have frequencies that are numerically quite a bit smaller than this order of magnitude. And because of that, they in fact can come to resonance during an end spiral. And uh, that could be exciting, except for the fact that unfortunately, uh, their coupling with the tidal field is very weak. And when you work through the details, you find that the G modes never do very much dynamically. They're not that significant. So uh, what I'll be you know, telling you about in a few moments is that, well, with rotation, you can identify new modes, not these ones, but new modes, where in fact, you can establish not just a resonance, but a strong resonance that will have measurable impact. All right, so let's switch on rotation. So what happens uh, when you switch on rotation? Well, two things happen. When you switch on rotation, first of all, uh, you know, the, uh, the spin of the neutron star will, will, will produce a deformation. So you will have a centrifugal deformation of the star. It will tend to bulge at the equator, it will flatten at the pole. And, uh, and that will affect the modes that we've talked about. So the P modes and the G modes that we've talked about in the case of a non-rotating star will acquire corrections because the deformation of the, uh, of the star will certainly affect the description of the modes. And those centrifugal corrections will tend to scale in this way. So they will be, you know, quadratic in the angular velocity of the star. That's my omega here. And the size of the correction tends to be, you know, of the order of magnitude of the ratio of omega squared to that gm over r cubed, uh, something that I've talked about uh, in the previous slide. And when you put in, you know, relevant scalings here, uh, you know, a spinning frequency of 100 hertz for the neutron star, solar mass, you know, 1.4 solar mass, radius of 10 kilometers, when you work out the scalings, uh, you find that the centrifugal corrections are fairly small. So you would have to spin up the star to a large value in order to generate centrifugal corrections that are important. Because of that, and because of the smallness of this number here, I'm going to be happy to take my rotation to be uh, such that, you know, I can neglect all centrifugal effects. So for me, I have slow rotation in the sense that this ratio is small and I will be you know, neglecting centrifugal effects. So my rotating star will, you know, to this approximation, retain its spherical shape. What I will do though, and that's the second aspect of including rotation, I will retain the Coriolis force, which is linear, not quadratic in the angular velocity. And adding the Coriolis force has a, you know, an impact on modes, not on those modes. If you include the Coriolis effect in the description of the fluid mechanics, what you find together with those people here is that a new class of modes emerges. You have new modes that come, that come out. They are restored by the Coriolis force instead of gravity or pressure. And they're called inertial modes because, well, they, you know, they are associated with that, with that fictitious force, that inertial force that comes linearly in, uh, in the angular velocity. Those new modes are going to be uh, behind the physics that I'll be talking about for the rest of the talk. Those inertial modes have some very interesting properties. So they are mostly perturbations in the velocity field. So uh, before I was focusing on perturbations in density, perturbation and pressure, those turn out to be small in this case. What really comes out strong for inertial modes are perturbations in the velocity inside the neutron star, the velocity of the fluid inside the neutron star. 
Another interesting property is that the eigenfrequencies of inertial modes are proportional to the angular frequency of rotation of the star up to a numerical factor of order unity. That number uh, is interesting because it depends on the mass distribution and, uh, and the mass distribution is determined by the equation of a state. So if you have access somehow to those frequencies and you know the spinning rate of your neutron star, that number in front tells you something about the equation of a state. And remember, this is what we're after. We're after uh, trying to pin down the nuclear physics of neutron stars through things that we can observe. And perhaps those frequencies can be observed, in which case we have further constraints on the, nucle on the nucle uh, nuclear physics, because this number is tied to the mass distribution. Now, two very important things. The frequencies here being proportional to the spinning rate of the neutron star can be in the LIGO Virgo CAGRA band, you know, between 100 hertz or so, you know, 10 hertz to 1000 hertz, if the neutron star spins at about that rate. So if the neutron, neutron star spin is around 100 hertz, then that means that this frequency over here will also be of the order of 100 hertz. And that's right in the middle of the LIGO Virgo CAGRA frequency band. And that means that you have the possibility of creating a resonance. And that's good. Now, if you try to work out the properties of those resonances, what you find that seems a bit discouraging at first is that those inertial modes, in fact, couple very weakly to a Newtonian tidal field. But as those people realized here, Flanagan and Racine realized a while back, is that those modes, in fact, couple strongly to a gravitomagnetic tidal field. So that's why I needed those two ingredients. I needed stellar rotation to produce those inertial modes. And I needed the gravitomagnetic tidal field in order to excite those modes in potentially a strong resonance. That will be what I'm trying to do next, describe the impact of this. So just to recap a little bit, we're interested in tidal effects within a rotating neutron star. So that's my first ingredient, rotation. We are interested in the effects associated with a gravitomagnetic tidal field that produces this V cross B type force that we've talked about. So we have the rotation entering into that V and we have gravitomagnetic uh, magnetism entering through that curl of U here. And what I want to basically do next is to use this force as a driving force for my inertial modes and see what that gives me in terms of physics. And in fact, uh, I can show that, you know, if I have a force of this type, the only modes that will care about this force are the inertial modes. The only modes that we've talked about, P modes and G modes, in fact, are, you know, uh, transparent to that force. The only modes that participate here are the inertial modes that, uh, that I've just introduced. So let's look at some consequences of this. And one consequence it has to do with the fact that if I want to describe the tidal deformation of my object, given the existence of that gravitomagnetic tidal force, uh, I have to do it not through what is called the love number that would be familiar from Newtonian physics, but I have to do it through a love tensor. And love here, just to, uh, to tell you, it's not just a name that we picked, it's you know, the name of Augustus Love who was a geophysicist who worked out the theory of the tidal deformation of the earth and introduced a bunch of numbers that characterize this tidal deformation. Here we're doing the same thing for a neutron star. So the usual story of a love number uh, is you know, something that you can infer in Newtonian physics. So it's a relationship between two tensors. And the first tensor is something that characterizes the strength of the tidal field. Let me describe this. So U is the scalar potential created by the companion. That's the familiar Newtonian potential coming from the orbiting companion. If I take a first derivative, I get the force associated with the scalar potential. And if I take a second derivative, I get the homogeneous part of that force. That's the force field that varies across the volume occupied by the neutron star. 
And that's the tidal force. And I can characterize this tidal force in terms of that two, that, you know, that tensor with two indices corresponding to the two differentiations that I've made on the scalar potential. If I want to describe the tidal deformation, I can do it through the quadrupole moment of the mass distribution. And that's the integral of the density times two occurrences of the position vector. And then for technical reasons, I remove the trace of that. That tensor over here tells me how deformed the body is. And if the body is spherical, that QAB would be zero. So that's the deformation. That's the source of the deformation. There's a relationship between the two that's governed by this number K that's called the love number. And in addition to that, I have you know, a scaling quantity G and a scaling with five powers of the radius of the, uh, of the body. K is the interesting part here because that's the thing that depends on the details of the mass distribution inside the star. And that's something that's determined by the equation of the state. That's the familiar story in Newtonian physics. One number does it all. But when we do it for a rotating star and when we do it for gravitomagnetic gravity instead of you know, you know, Newtonian gravity, uh, then we end up with something more complicated and that number has to be replaced by a tensor. And I'll explain that in the next slide. So I'm taking my uh, gravitomagnetic potential here and I'm expanding it you know, in, uh, in time as a Fourier series. Omega will be the frequency of that tidal field. And I'm also expanding uh, it in you know, a Fourier series in phi, the, uh, the angle around my neutron star with the familiar quantum number M that comes with it. If I want to describe the gravitomagnetic tidal field and characterize it in the same way I did before, well, I have to take my field, so that involves one derivative through that curl here. But then to capture the homogeneities, I have to uh, take a second derivative. That's the extra derivative I, I have here. And when I do two things, the, those two derivatives, then I have a characterization of the gravitomagnetic tidal field through that tensor. If I want to describe the deformation of the body uh, in that context, well, now I'm not talking about of the mass distribution. I'm talking about a deformation of the mass currents inside my star. I have mass, uh, but I also have a velocity perturbation inside my star. And that produces therefore a deformation in the velocity field inside the neutron star. And that has to be captured by something called a current quadrupole moment that I define here. What is that? Well, I have my mass current over here, rho times V, and I have two occurrences of the position vector here and here. And that combination here, you know, involving that cross product is the thing that gives me a meaningful deformation of the neutron star, given that the nature of the deformation now is in the mass currents not in the mass density itself. Another way to read this is to recognize this as the density of angular momentum inside my star. And then I add an extra you know, occurrence of the position vector and do the integral. The love quantity, the love tensor is gonna be a relationship between the source of the tidal field and the consequence of the tidal field measured by those two tensors. And what happens here uh, for you know, various technical reasons is the fact that that relationship between the deformation and the tidal field cannot be captured by a single number. It has to be captured in fact by a collection of three different numbers because I have a tidal field that depends on M that azimutal quantum number that I've talked about before. And each value of M produces different tidal effects and each of those tidal effects has to be captured separately with a love number that depends on m, one for m equals zero, m equals one, m equals two. And I stop here because I'm describing everything here at you know, quadrupolar order. And you can think of that tidal tensor that occurs here as uh, something that is a collection, a meaningful you know, packaging of those three love numbers. And I'm showing you here uh, what the you know, love number for M equals one, what it looks like. 
And what you should see here is, well, you have the love number in some, you know, it's a dimensionless thing as a function of the ratio of the external frequency, that's the frequency of the tidal field, or that's the orbital frequency of the companion divided by the rotational frequency of the star. And what we have here are four different curves corresponding to different density models for, uh, for the star. And what you should see here, even though the, the, you know, the plot is a bit busy, is that each model produces a different distribution of mass inside the star, and that produces a different love number as a function of that ratio of frequencies. And what you should see on top of that is the fact that at some frequencies here, this one over here or that one over there, we have a jump from minus infinity to plus infinity, and here a jump to, you know, from plus infinity to minus infinity. Those are, those are the resonances that I've talked about. When you have a frequency omega here, an external frequency that matches one of your mode frequencies, you get a huge response from the fluid that's a resonance, and that resonance produces a huge spike in, uh, in the love number that is designed to measure that response. So that's an, an interesting thing, and what I want to do is to wrap this up by telling you, you know, what observational impact those resonances can have. So let's go back to the original context. We have this binary system involving at least one neutron star, we have a tidal field created by the orbiting body around that you know, reference neutron star. And now we see that that tidal field, especially its gravitomagnetic component, can, uh, can introduce a resonance. Sorry, I, I have my 40 minute warning here. Uh, so we have that the gravitomagnetic part of the tidal field can exert those, uh, you know, can drive those inertial modes inside the star. And if we have a match between a mode frequency and the orbital frequency of the companion star, we can produce those resonances. And in fact, when you look at, you know, the fact that you have more than one mode active here, but you have a whole collection of modes, what you discover is that in the course of an in spiral, there can be a succession of four you know, different resonances because four different modes will, uh, will undergo resonance one after the other. So this is a cartoon here of the frequency evolution during an n-spiral starting at low frequency evolving to large frequencies. So that's frequency, you know, orbital frequency as a function of time during an n-spiral. Merger occurs right here at t equals zero. What you see is that when the frequency uh, when the frequency matches something a little bit under 50 hertz or a little bit above 100, a little bit you know before you know 130 or so and 140, what you find is that you have a match between a mode frequency and the orbital frequency at that time, and at that point you have a resonance. And when you have a resonance, that means that you you know you create a very large response of your fluid. The fluid goes crazy. And that means that you're putting in a lot of energy into, uh, into the internal motions of the fluid at the expense of orbital energy. And that means that during each one of those resonances here, you're, you're taking away suddenly energy from the orbital energy. And that means that you're changing the properties of the orbit. The orbit will jump from one orbital radius to another very suddenly. And that will happen once, twice, three times, four times during the in-spiral. And this sudden change in the, orbital energy, in the orbital radius is going to be manifested in the, in the uh, emitted gravitational waves. And that's something that can be you know, measured uh, you know, by LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA, maybe not right now, but uh, you know, in a few years when the uh, sensitivity of the detectors have become a little bit better. So the point is that the sudden changes in the orbital motion has a manifestation in the emitted gravitational waves, and that in time will produce a dephasing of the waves that can be measured in gravitational wave detectors. So what I've done in one of my papers is to calculate this dephasing, and uh, what I'm showing here is the end result, how it scales with, say, a stellar radius 
you know, the mass of the neutron star, the mass of the companion, the total mass of the system, how it scales with the spin frequency of the neutron star. And what remains after you ta you've taken all the scaling away is a numerical coefficient that's gonna be a function of the inclination orbit. And that's the angle between the spin axis of the neutron star and the axis of the orbital plane, you know, the, the normal to the orbital plane, uh, you know, in which the uh, companion is, you know, is going. So that's gamma, the numerical factor in terms of inclination angle as a function of different models of neutron stars, different mass distributions, you know, corresponding to different assumed equations of state for, uh, for the neutron star material. And what you should see here is that, well, that numerical factor here tends to be fairly small unless, you know, nature is kind and produces for you misaligned uh, uh, situations where the spin axis points one way and the orbital angular momentum points in the opposite direction. That's the uh, angle here being equal to pi producing large values here and values that can be, you know, up to something like point 20 or point 10 or something like that. And uh, that's gonna be uh, almost my last point here. Uh, that means that while you can, you know, if nature is kind, gives you those spinning neutron stars and give you those misaligned orbits, uh, that means that you have a phase shift of the order of, you know, point 10 or so that can be measured in a gravitational wave detection if your signal to noise ratio is larger than say 20 or so. And uh, not possible right now, but possible in the near future and certainly routine when we're talking about, you know, next generation, third generation gravitational wave detectors. So those resonances produced by gravitomagnetic tidal effects are real and eventually they will be detected. So let me just stop here and just point out that while the physics I think is very interesting and rich in terms of consequences, and, uh, and some of them are, I think, interesting from theoretical, you know, from a theoretical perspective, but some of them I think are important for gravitational wave astronomy. And I think they open up a, a new way of constraining, constraining nuclear matter, the equation of the state of nuclear matter, because those resonances give us a different handle, a different way of observing those tidal phenomena that are ultimately governed by all this nuclear physics. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I broke my promise of keeping under 40 minutes. So I apologize for that. No worry. Thank you very much for this wonderful webinar. Let me check the YouTube channel. Okay. Um, there's a question on the YouTube. We have to wait a little bit. There might be perhaps a delay. One is talking about uh, it says the following, is it possible that once a certain mass is achieved, the observed event horizon might be something akin to superconductivity, but for, for gravity over a small locality? Uh, so I'm not sure I understand the question. So if we're talking about a black hole, then we don't have uh, for black holes the same sort of, you know, superconducting property uh, of materials, for example, that they would expel magnetic fields. So it's still possible for black holes to, you know, absorb magnetic fields. You can have magnetic fields that are, you know, threaded by, you know, magnetic field threaded by magnetic fields. So you still have, you know, magnetic field lines inside the black hole. So you don't have this, you know, the, the, this, uh, this phenomenon associated with superconductivity where the magnetic field lines would be expelled. Mm -hmm by black holes. Uh, so I guess the answer to the question, to the extent I understand it is no. So, so there, there's no phase transition for black holes that would be analogous to a superconducting phase transition for, you know, for matter. Okay, and I, and I think I, ha I have a question which is a little bit related to, to what you were just mentioning, which is, um, could you please comment a little bit on the connection between the equation of a state and measuring these properties like because I can imagine, I don't know, maybe we can have a, a neutron star that is so crazy inside that none of this will matter. I don't know, because the pressure or because of superconductivity such that the fluid just moves around and, and then we don't get. Is it, does it depend on how does it depend on the question of state? 
Yeah, so it, it depends very strongly on the equation of state. So basically all those, uh, so, so the main idea is this. So in gravitational waves, you can see the fact that you've hit a resonance, you know, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe four times during an in-spiral. And hopefully in the gravitational wave measurement, you can measure the frequency of those resonances. Now, those frequencies probably will not match the predictions that I've made based on my models of neutron stars because mm -hmm. my models don't incorporate all the relevant physics. But the point is that if you measure the frequencies, you can perhaps build a better model for, uh, for neutron stars with more exact information concerning the equation of state, more information about possible phase transitions inside the neutron star, uh, in a way that eventually the model will hopefully match, you know, the, the frequency, the, the resonant frequencies measured in one detection, another detection, the third detection, hundreds of detections eventually, so that through the, you know, through the measurement of the uh, resonant frequencies, you can start saying something meaningful about, uh, you know, the nature of the neutron star, its equation of state, its mass distribution, whatever phase transitions might occur, okay. all of that. So that's really the, the hope here is that, you know, okay. through obs Got observation, it. you can infer enough properties of neutron stars to be able to pin down the nature of nuclear matter. Okay. And of course, you know, that works in this context. It works in the context of measuring X-ray emissions. It works mm -hmm. in, you know, other ways too. So you hope to bring all of this together, all those strands together and, uh, and eventually say something that, you know, measurements in the lab on earth won't be able to tell you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll check the YouTube channel. Someone here in the audience, in the low coordinators, have a question? I have a question. So, so all this analysis has been assuming that general relativity is is general is what what is describing this correctly, right? Right. Uh, how sensitive is all this analysis to modifications of of gravity? So, for example, if if these frequencies. Uh, don't match the model that you have or the equation of state that you have for a, for a neutron star. How is it is to discern if this is me because we don't understand well the neutron star, so maybe it is sensitive to some modification to the formalism. Right. So, so that, that's a very uh, important question. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion on this. And I observed that testing GR has become a bit of an obsession. Everybody's trying to test GR. And I think there are good ways of testing GR when you have a very clean astronomical system like a binary black hole. And you, for example, observe gravitational waves coming from a binary black hole. You can measure enough things in the gravitational waves that allow you to perform you know, good tests of GR. I think that's a very good way of doing it. But when you're dealing with a messy astrophysical system where you know, there's a lot more uncertainty in the matter physics than the gravitational physics, I think uh, it's probably not likely that you can use those systems to test GR. You can use those systems, assuming GR, to test the unknown astrophysics of your system, the unknown nuclear physics of your system. That's where all the uncertainties are. They're, they're far dominant compared to the uncertainties associated with perhaps GR breaking down or not being applicable in strong fields. Uh, that's a personal opinion. I think that kind of, you know, you know, in my mind, this kind of proviso applies to, for example, trying to test GR through observations of uh, M87. I mean, the, the shadow of M87, uh, people have tried to, you know, take those observations and, you know, read them into tests of GR. Well, I don't buy that because the astrophysics is so messy, so far more uncertain that I think you have to assume GR and do your best to try to pin down the astrophysics. Maybe one day the astrophysics will be so well understood that you can use those sources as ways of testing GR, but I don't think that will happen anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to comment on that, but let's, let's go on the YouTube channel. Uh, we have a question from Emmanuel Blue. She's asking, which is the order of importance of these gravitomagnetic modes compared to the usual modes of neutron stars, like the T modes, G modes? Right, F so, modes, and, and that depends on what is driving the modes. So the, 
So uh, in the context that I was talking about here, if you, so the, uh, the initial modes are, so if you, if you look at the driving in terms of a Newtonian tidal field, what you find is that the initial modes are completely irrelevant. So the, the, uh, the physics of Newtonian tides is completely governed by P modes and G modes, mostly P modes. Uh, but if you forget about this, that's, that's true. If you forget about this and now look at the influence of the gravitomagnetic part of the tidal field, then it's the other way around. The P modes and G modes are completely irrelevant and it's the inertial mode that, that, that dominates. Now the Newtonian tidal forces of course dominate everything. So the, the gravitomagnetic tidal forces that I focused on are smaller, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that the impact of this force is not important because even though the tidal force is smaller, gravitomagnetic tidal force is smaller, they can still produce resonances. Whereas the you know, stronger Newtonian tidal force doesn't produce resonances, or at least not strong ones. So the beauty of this is that through the resonance effect, you can have a mode that normally would be irrelevant become dynamically very important. And that's, that's what happened here. Nice. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think Roberto has a question. Yeah, I have a question. Very nice, uh, the webinar, Eric. So I have two Two questions, I mean, maybe now three with the last question that I asked. Uh, the first one, when, when you were making this analogy between gravity and electromagnetism, let's say with the scalar potential and the vector potential, uh, do you expect also to have, I mean, in this model, do you also have these mathematical properties like gauge transformation, but for the uh, gravity potential, let's say? I mean, similar yeah. to the yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, the formalism is very close to electromagnetism. So, uh, so in gravity, you have you know something that's often you know often called gauge transformations, completely analogous to what you find in electromag uh, electromagnetism, except that the gauge transformations in the context of gravity are just ways of talking about coordinate changes. So, what you can always do, uh, even if you work close to flat space time is to change the, uh, the mathematical expression of the gravitational field by introducing some slight coordinate deformations. And a priori, it's hard to distinguish what is a true gravitational effect from what is just a, you know, a coordinate effect. And uh, the formalism of gauge transformations allow you to sort of make sense of all of this. And uh, what, I've cho you know, what I've chosen to do in this work is to you know, pick a gauge and work in this gauge, and that makes everything gauge invariant, uh, you know, as a result. So, so uh, I think I'm safe from all this, you know, complexity of, you know, gauges, different gauges producing different effects and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, the, the second question is, is about the, the tidal effect, the, the one that you, you had with the rho v times the, the, the rest of the... So is it possible to, that this tidal effect can modify the, I don't know, kind of generate electrical movement of, of charges within the neutral star or the companion neutral star in that sense that modify the magnetic field, I mean, the, the magnetic field, not the, the part of the gravity, like, and yeah, also no, to that, modify, for instance, the, these jets that some neutron stars, they have like, like the kind of signature for pulsars or. Yeah, or that, that's a very interesting question. And I, I I don't know the answer. Well, in principle, yes. And in principle, that can be a very interesting effect. And that's something that I, at some point, want to get back to. So what's the, what's the effect of this velocity perturbation that I'm introducing inside a neutron star to a magnetic field that might be there? And we know that, you know, that neutron stars are magnetized. Therefore, this you know, combination of magnetic physics and fluid physics uh, is going to be present. And uh, we know that uh, differential rotation inside a neutron star can produce an amplification of the magnetic field. So I suspect that you know, those modes can do the same. So those modes, especially at resonance, can probably produce some sizable magnification of the magnetic field. But I haven't worked out anything about this. I don't know the orders of magnitude. I haven't worked this out. But I suspect that this is something that's going to be very interesting to look into in the future. 
Yes. Thank you. No, because I, I was also, I mean, because I remember that when, when sometimes the neutron star they have this kind of kind of relaxation ways that and then in which that the, the kind of the size, I don't know the, but they emit a, a pulse of electromagnetic radiation from time to time when they are the right. ticking when the, for the pulsar. Yeah. So I was wondering if this effect could enhance this type of ticking time because you show that you have some resonance mode in the when when you are yeah. expanding so, I don't it's know it's possible so, so what you were talking about is the effect on the crust that sometimes there's a there's a little bit of a tectonic you know, uh, type shift in the yeah. in the crust and yeah if you have you know fluid motions under the crust that uh, that get resonant like this it could certainly uh, affect the crust as well so yeah there's a there's a ton of physics that can be incorporated in all of this and uh, yeah who knows okay thanks thank you and i think we're doing pretty well on time so we have let me try to ask the last question that i see here could you please comment on the discussion about black holes falling in love that's in quotes do get do black holes get deformed could you please share your thoughts on that right so so black holes are strange in the sense that so the love number that would give a characterization of its quadrupole deformation uh, relative to the strength of the tidal field, that love number goes to zero. That, no, that number is zero for black holes. Now, what does it mean? Well, uh, it doesn't mean that the black hole doesn't deform. So the black hole in fact does deform. If you were to take the black hole and measure the shape of its event horizon, you would find that that shape is not spherical, that, you know, deformation, that there is a deformation of the event horizon. So it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? Well, what does it mean for a non-zero love number for a neutron star? Well, it means that uh, the matter inside the neutron star is shifted, is, you know, is you know, rearranging itself because of the existence of the tidal field. So the K really measure this rearrangement of the mass and that's the thing that's measured in the, uh, in the quadruple moment of the mass distribution. For a black hole, you don't have this rearrangement of mass because black holes are nothing. Black holes are just things that exist as boundaries in space time, except maybe all the matter at the singularity, but if the matter is at the singularity, well, it's kind of stuck there, it cannot rearrange itself. So that is the thing that is, you know, that lack of ability for the black hole mass to rearrange itself is the thing that is you know, captured by the statement that the love number for black holes is, is zero. Uh, if you are not happy with you know, these words that I've just used, I don't blame you because those are just words. And I don't like to speak of mass being stuck to the singularity. I have no idea what this means. But you know, as a sort of an analogy, as a sort of thing that you know, sort of conveys uh, the result, I think it's okay, but you know, don't, don't you know, don't ask me to hold on to, the, to those very vague ideas. Thank you. Uh, and I think that's it. So thank you very much for this wonderful low physics webinar. And thank you everyone for attending today to this session. We'd give you a, you know, a virtual applause that is very common these days. Yeah. And thank you, Eric, for sharing your um, research. And for everybody in the audience, let us keep in touch, please. We'll keep having more uh, webinars in this uh, season. So thank you very much and goodbye to everyone. Yeah, thank you. And thanks again for the invitation. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Good, we are not live. <laughs>